Welcome to Hordes Dairyman Livestream. I'm your host, Corey Geiger, Managing Editor of Hordes Dairyman. I'm joining the broadcast remotely today from dairy country up in Northeast Wisconsin. We have an exciting episode planned for this week, Dairy Traders Talking Trade. Today's guests have decades of experience marketing dairy products from milk from our U.S. dairy farms and our U.S. dairy cows. Before we start the conversation with our guests, let's discuss some recent market activity. In May, U.S. dairy export volume reached a two-year high, accounting for 17.4% of the nation's milk production. These exports were paced by record sales of nonfat dry milk and skim milk powder. And as our guests talk about that, some of these sales actually happened, you know, were consummated two months earlier in March, but that's the way the markets work. And uh, the other cheese, lactose, and whey shipments also rose compared to the previous month. We're going to call upon Jim Paltz, our producer, to start with our first poll question today as we talk about dairy exports. Who is not one of the big three when it comes to dairy exporters? So pick which country is not three of the, one of the three largest exporters in the world. So go ahead, if you're watching online on your computer, you can put that answer in. Some people treat this as a pop podcast and do so only uh, on their phone, so then you can't take the poll. We'll wait a few more uh, seconds. We're well over 60% of these uh, answers are submitted here. And Jim, when you're comfortable, go ahead and close the poll here. The correct answer, 71% of you got the correct answer, it's Canada. And actually the European Union, when you add all the countries of Europe, now minus Great Britain, is a very major ex uh, exporter, even larger than the US. And New Zealand, of course, is number one. So when it comes to talking dairy traders, talking dairy trade, the topic of today's dairy live stream, Ted Jacoby has been working with America's top export customer, Mexico just about as long as anyone. After starting out his career with Bongard's Creameries, Ted transitioned to T. C. Jacoby Company in 1996, just two years after NAFTA was inked and just one year after the U.S. Dairy Export Council was launched. Ted began working with the company's recently opened Mexico City office. Talk about being on the front lines, Ted. Ted has seen many sides of dairy trade, and I look forward to hearing his insight on all things important including the Mexican market that last year accounted for 1.5 billion, and that's B billion, a remarkable 25% of all U.S. dairy exports in 2019. Ted, what are you seeing in Mexico and with other U.S. dairy export, uh, export customers? Sure. Uh, so Mexico, Mexico's struggling. They've, they've improved a little bit in the last uh, month or two, uh, but I think the way to, to look at it is, you know, the pandemic hit China first, then really hit Europe, then came to the U.S., and Mexico's actually been lagging a little bit behind the U.S. Um, uh, but as the pandemic started hitting the world, uh, the exchange rate, the peso, which had been stable around 1850 for almost four years, uh, shot up to 25 pesos a dollar. It's since settled down to about 22 and a half, but that's an indication of uh, how the Mexican economy has been struggling. Uh, we saw during the, the initial stages, March and April, we did see a pullback in exports to Mexico. Um, and, uh, and since then, June, those numbers, at least from what we've seen internally, have come back, but they aren't all the way back to where they were last year. Um, Non-fat S&P Im, uh, imports, Mexican imports, are off as much as 30%. At least that's what the April numbers were, that they were off as much as 30% versus the previous year. They improved in May. We saw an improvement internally in May, and we think they improved a little bit more again in June, but they're still off relative to the previous year. Um, we've heard people say that the economy, the GDP may run as much as 10% behind the previous year, and they could be facing one of the uh, largest um, uh, recessions in a century. I think that's a little bit too pessimistic, uh, but they're certainly struggling. The good news is everybody needs to eat, and, and Mexico is a regular importer of food, and when it comes to dairy, the U.S. is their number one export partner. Um, the challenge has been that everybody has suffered during the pandemic. Um, China came back first, and so we've seen a pickup in exports 
to China, but it is a very, very competitive market right now. And so from a price standpoint, we are competing against the Europeans, we are competing against uh, the New Zealanders, and I think the U.S. has struggled to really uh, achieve uh, uh, the amount of exports we would hope for in Southeast Asia. So everybody has been turning to Mexico, and uh, Mexican exports just aren't that strong as well. And so what you're seeing, especially when it comes uh, to non-fat dry milk and skim milk powder, is you're seeing a market uh, where prices are, are low, they're struggling to, to get up, margins are being compressed, um, and, and it's been a real struggle. Um, at the same time, uh, cheese exports to Mexico are also down. That to me is a little bit of a different dynamic. I would say cheese is probably a little bit more sensitive to economic activity in Mexico, so that's playing a role. Uh, but the other thing that's playing a role is our cheese price in the, in the United States right now is $2.50 a pound. And so we are not competitive at all when it comes to cheese in the world market. We are competitive with non-fat dry milk and skim milk powder. We are, you could argue that we're competitive with butter. Butter is a different animal because we make 80% butter. Most of the world makes 82% butter, which makes it difficult for us to be competitive on a consistent basis with butter. But when it comes to cheese, um, it's, it's as much a price issue as it is anything else. Uh, so overall, I would say Mexico is improving. They're starting to move in the right direction, but it's an uphill battle. And they're, they're facing some of the same struggles that the U.S. is in terms of dealing with COVID-19 and the pandemic right now. Ted, I, uh, we, our viewers probably know this, especially our long-term viewers dairy live stream that we do a dress rehearsal the day before. And one of the things I've learned in covering markets and especially our dairy export markets is relationships matter and, and service matters. And we're, the American dairy industry is learning more and more to do that. And you've been in, in doing that as long as possible. I was interested to hear yesterday about your uh, service to the Mexican market and, and how you have a warehouse very close to the border there to help service an immediate customer need. Would you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So um, I think most of the, the companies that do a large amount of exports to Mexico, one of the big things that the U.S. can bring to the table for the Mexican customer is we are right next door. If, if they're going to be ordering product from Europe, it's going to take a month or two months for that product to get to Mexico. New Zealand, it's the same thing. But in the U.S., we have customers who order non-fat dry milk, uh, various whey products, even various cheeses on a very regular basis, and we can deliver that to them uh, almost instantaneously, or I would say within uh, a few days of when they purchase the product. So we have a warehouse in El Paso where we store powder every day so that when the opportunities present themselves, we can immediately get that product across the, the border and, and sell it to the customers in Mexico. And uh, that would be El Paso, Texas. Uh, I'd like to also, get, Correa should also add, Laredo is another big uh, border crossing point. We favor El Paso. I think a lot of the dairy industry favors El Paso. And then if you're pulling product out of the West, Tijuana is also a big, a big place where they cross. And Tijuana would be just south of the California border. I'd like to remind our uh, viewers of Dairy Livestream here that uh, if you have a question, go ahead and type that into the question panel. Our second half of the program will be devoted to answering those questions. And before we introduce our next Dairy Livestream guest, we're gonna go to another poll question. The poll question reads like this. But by 2029, the EU, New Zealand, and the US, the big three exporters, could account for what percent of the global dairy trade. So you're just gonna select one answer here, 25 to 30%, 37%, excuse me, 45 to 47%, 65 to 77%, or 85 to 97%. You'll see those ranges are purposely 20 points apart to give a good uh, chance of getting this right on this multiple choice quiz. And this information is actually from a report that came out last week from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, those who see acronyms all, all the time will know that group is simply FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization. We, uh, the poll responses are coming in here strong. We got 60 plus percent voted. So Jim, when our uh, producer, when you feel that we're good, cut that off. And 59% got the answer right. It is uh, C, 65 to 77%. And that is a lot. That makes the European Union, New Zealand, 
and the United States major players there. Our next guest, Kevin Ellis, is dairy to the core. Born and raised on a New York dairy farm, Kevin got his start in the industry as a dairy nutritionist, a loan officer, and later a dairy financial uh, consultant. Kevin joined the Cayuga Marketing Cooperative in 2008, where he assisted in the development of a milk processing plant for that organization. In 2019, Kevin helped Cayuga step up its game, working to develop the Cayuga Milk Ingredients Division that specializes in dairy ingredients for global nutrition companies. Kevin, you've been working with the dairy export markets for some time. What's your take on the current markets and how it relates to the pandemic? And welcome to the program, Kevin. Glad to be here, Corey. Uh, and I think I'll echo a lot of what Ted uh, had discussed as well. It's, um, you know, when, when it comes to non-fat and skim milk powder globally, it's, it's very much a commodity market. It's very transparent. And um, what we're seeing is we're seeing an abundance through this, uh, certainly through COVID, uh, there's an abundance of skim milk uh, powder globally. Um, it has led to some, some you know, margin suppression in certain regions of the world. Um, luckily for us, the, we're focused on meeting the stringent demands of some of our customers, so we haven't, we haven't witnessed that uh, uh, decrease in demand thus far. But we are seeing some, some downward pressure on pricing. Uh, but I do see some optimism, especially in Southeast Asia, where they focus on the global, um, global dairy trade. Um, which is the auction that's run out of New Zealand. You're now seeing uh, $1.22 was the last uh, GDT auction. So that, that signifies that they're about 20 cents a pound ahead of uh, the U.S. So I think there's some opportunity for the U.S. to go into Southeast Asia and, and find some opportunities, um, as well as the Middle East. Um, but we have to be focused on quality focused on what those customers want, and really learn to market our products better than just a, a commodity. And it's always been the situation in the United States where we've balanced off our milk supply um, as nonfat dry milk, and then we just expect to export it at a high price. We really have to focus on what the customers want, and as long as we're willing to do that, I see opportunity everywhere, and um, I'm quite optimistic about it. But um, that is correct. It's there's quite a bit of uh, uh, margin compression around the globe right now, especially from our EU counterparts that we compete with. They're very competitive at the moment. And Kevin, your business is a little bit different than Ted's. Uh, you focus on uh, a number of different markets. Ted does too, but uh, where those some of those sales go is a little bit different. And if you want to talk about that to bring our viewers up to speed. Um, sure. We're, um, I classify us as a, as a B2B producer, so we only sell to other businesses. Um, you know, our focus area here is in domestic terms. All of our liquid ingredients are marketed mostly domestic. We, um, we try to export the majority of our dry powders. And the, and the reason being, um, we're moving away from nonfat dry milk and more into skim milk powder because we can standardize skim milk powder to 34% protein. So not only can we typically get a price increase on skim milk powder, we can also get a yield enhancement by standardizing our high protein milk down to 34% on a standardized basis. So we've we focused on exports and we found a real sweet spot into Southeast Asia, namely Indonesia, Malaysia. Philippines, Vietnam, Japan, and um, most recently um, China. It's been China has been tough since we were approved um, as a registrant in China. Um, that's when Trump put the tariff uh, the tariffs in place. So um, my first two loads got into China, and then uh, the business stopped after that. But it's starting to pick back up again. So we also have some. Uh, good customers in the Middle East area as well. So we focused on, on customers that have high quality standards that use our powder to reconstitute for drinking milk in other countries um, and um, have made some real headway into the infant formula markets as well. I know when I've been uh, in Vietnam one time on a, for a U.S. Dairy Export Council trade mission, Vina Milk is one of the customers and they actually have probably one of the most modern 
theory processing plants to reconstitute those powders because they're worried it's a tropical climate, it's not very cow friendly, and because of all that, there's issues with spores and bacteria, and they do UHT milk. So when they get those powders there, it's a big deal, and they really take extra extra care to make sure it's a, a good product on the back end. So it's uh, interesting to see these uh, our U.S. dairy goods go into these countries and how they get handled. Yeah, I, I'd echo that, Corey. I, I, we've probably been to the same plant that, uh, that was run by Vena Milk. It was impressive to me to see them running robotic palletizers and robotic forklifts and uh, completely mechanized. So, you know, we as Americans have this, uh, if we haven't been to these countries, you have this you know, preconceived notion that they're behind the times. So it's anything but. Some of the customers that we deal with internationally are some of the most advanced people in terms of you know, biological sciences and, uh, and mechanical processes. It's quite humbling, actually. And they also want to see what it looks like here in the U.S. One time uh, they did a reverse trade mission and uh, happened to come to the Hordes Dairyman Farm. We have about a five, uh, 500 cow dairy there. And most of those people that gave me a tour there hopped off the bus and they wanted to talk cow. They didn't want to talk processing, but they wanted to have consumer confidence, really, which was neat. Uh, for our viewers, B2B is business to business. So like Hordes Dairyman would be a business to business magazine versus what you would call popular press. And so that same term would apply to what Cayuga is directly selling to another uh, manufacturer in these countries. And the other I item that Ted brought up yesterday is that about, if I remember correctly, Ted, 50% of our uh, non-fat uh, dry milk powders are exported. So it's a big market for the United States. Is that the correct number? Absolutely. In fact, I think it's pushing 60 to 65% at this point. Um, you know, that's one of the interesting things about the U.S. dairy industry. Um, cheese is still, 95% of all cheese is still consumed domestically. Um, over 95, I think it's more like 99% of all butter is consumed domestically. Uh, but when it comes to non-fat dry milk, it, it is predominantly an exported product. And a lot of the whey products are also uh, very influenced by the export market. And so one way to put it into perspective is right now the world price for cheese, I would say, is probably somewhere between $1.60 and $1.70 a pound. As anybody who follows the domestic dairy markets know, we're sitting at over a dollar fit or excuse me, $2.50 a pound in cheese in the US right now. Um, but when it comes to non-fat dry milk, you know, our domestic price is sitting right around a dollar a pound. Uh, the European price for skim milk is probably around a dollar ten right now, um, but they have some logistics advantages. GDT, I think we were at a dollar twenty-two when it came to um, skim milk powder out of New Zealand. That's both logistic, and they do tend to uh, just because they've been in that market for so long, tend to command a bit of a premium. Um, but but those relationships are so tight that that we're competing every day in the global market uh, to get to to sell product to those customers. Um, it's And as the U.S. dairy industry grows, if we're not growing our domestic market, we're going to be need to be growing our international market. But that also means we're going to be even more exposed to global price forces. And, and those price forces, um, understanding what that means for pricing in the U.S., I think is really important. And I think one of the things that's happened in the last 20 years, we've gone from exporting, what, 3.5% of our of our dairy solids to, as you just said, 17.3% uh, in the last month. That's putting stress on our federal order system because the federal order system wasn't designed to take into account the fact that we're exporting that larger percentage of our milk and we're gonna have those international forces affecting our milk price. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more detail in our question and answer. And I'm going to remind, and we just had a couple of viewers put some questions in here that I'll be sorting through, uh, to go ahead and type those into the panel here on your, on your uh, dashboard for go to webinar control panels. And with that, we're going to go to one more poll question before we invite Mark to make some comments. So Jim Baltz, our producer, will put that up there. What percent of the world's milk production gets traded internationally? So we got 20 point spreads here on this again, 28, 48, or 68. So go ahead and give that answer here. And this is a little tricky because what's your base for milk production? Uh, countries like India and Pakistan are, uh, India is the world's largest 
milk producer, but half of that never reaches a pasteurizer. So it's always a little bit of uh, how you're counting the apples up first, or in this case, the milk in the bulk tank. But uh, we're over half answered here. When we hit the 60% mark, Jim, you can go ahead and cut that off uh, and we'll display the right answer. A lot of people said B, 28%, and then 48%. Remarkably, it's only 8%. So the New Zealand, European Union, and the United States, in that order, are the three biggest players, and they are going to have about roughly two-thirds of the milk exported to three-quarters. But it's only 8% that we're talking about that gets traded internationally. Mark Stevenson, welcome back to Dairy Livestream. Consumers are demanding dairy, and can you help tie together Ted and Kevin's observations on our U.S. dairy export markets and the whole and dairy trade as a whole? Well, I'd be happy to uh, to give it a shot. Um, you know, I guess just based on the conversation that we've been listening to already, uh, it, it brought up some new ideas to me that I really hadn't prepared for, but you know, I'd like to at least mention and talk about a little bit. The U.S. is the third largest exporter, uh, world exporter of dairy products, a uh, very important position. We're well behind numbers one and two um, at this point in time, but, but nevertheless, uh, we're an important and large player. But very different kinds of commitments, I think, toward exporting. Take a country like New Zealand, uh, you know, 90, 95% of their milk production is going to be exported. Uh, they are committed to exports. That's a primary channel for them. So they're, they're very much looking at that. The European Union has historically produced quite a lot of milk, and they've exported quite a bit of it, um, much of that to assure that their domestic prices remain relatively strong. In other words, they don't want a burden of milk on their domestic markets to suppress those prices. So, uh, you know, there has been a difference uh, between those kind of products. The U.S., and correct me if you would care to, uh, Ted or Kevin, but I think we kind of stumbled in some ways into exports um, as we became competitive. It would just, all of a sudden, one day we went from that 3% um, of exports and about the same volume of imports in this country to um, exporting quite a bit of product because we were price competitive. But, you know, we're kind of walking this knife edge. Sometimes we're very competitive and there are products that we're consistently competitive with like um, skim milk powder, non-fat dry milk, and certainly whey. Um, but there are other products that some years were competitive. Um, cheese is a good example, butter is a good example, and some years we aren't. And when we walk that knife's edge, we are either potentially an exporter of these products or we're potentially an importer of these products. And I throw out butter as an example of that. Uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, um, Ireland was sending us a lot of butter uh, because our price was higher than these world markets. We weren't exporting anything and, uh, you know, we became a destination for product. So, you know, we, uh, we are exporting something close to 15, 16% of our solids on a pretty regular basis. And I do hear some dairy farmers saying, I'm not really sure that we should be a major exporter of dairy products. That hurts my prices. Well, I'll tell you what, if you want to rip that Band-Aid off and go back to our, you know, about equivalent uh, importer exporter, 3% or 4% or something of milk production, woo, that is going to be painful. And you got to ask yourself, you know, which uh, 10, 12 percent of dairy farms uh, should go away. Um, that's that's going to be a hard thing to do. So I, I don't think that's even a question we should be contemplating. I think what we should be contemplating is who should our customers be? How do we satisfy their needs and what products are we really going to be looking at? Um, as both Ted and Kevin indicated skim milk powder has been a good market for us and continues to be. Um, it is north of 60% right now of the volume of that product produced that does get exported and whey products are typically even larger. Um, we, we export a lot of whey and uh, we don't think about that as being a primary product but it has an impact on the milk check and it is a large volume product and a good product for us to export. 
Um, we did manage to actually move more product in the last couple of months of skim milk powder than we produced. And so we drew down inventories a little bit. I think that gives us an opportunity to think about whether or not we could see some price strengthening. And the same thing is likely to be true in world markets. I'd talk a little bit about some of our competitors, you know, and their milk production. Last month, our milk production was below year earlier levels. The milk production report that just came out showed that the U.S. was just slightly up uh, this month from where we were at year uh, ago levels. But in general, um, the world is not producing an excessive amount of milk. New Zealand and the European Union um, have both been flat to slightly down. Uh, the world does not have a burdensome supply of milk and dairy products available. And so I do think that when we begin to crawl out of this COVID oppression that we've been under, and uh, if recession is not going to be crushing, you know, for the rest of the world, there's an opportunity to think about some export demand. And Ted was absolutely correct that that's where we're going to see the growth in real opportunities. Domestically, our production has held up well. So, you know, with those kind of comments, I'd like to just get into some discussion. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I appreciate your uh, perspective on how important the U exports are to the U.S. dairy industry. I could even take it one step farther for those who disagree that we should be in the export market at this point. There's really no turning back. If you figure, use a number roughly 15%, if we don't want to be in the export market, then the plan would be to uh, cull all the cows in Wisconsin, and then we might have to add a state like Vermont in uh, to right size our dairy industry. And I don't see anyone having an appetite for something like that. It keeps it all in perspective, I think. It, it'll, it'll open up doors and opportunities. And I think obviously those that are joining us today are probably like, when are they going to talk about the new USMCA agreement? That is the United States-Mexico-Canadian agreement. That's the new trade agreement that uh, replaced NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. That was the law of traders in the North American continent for 26 years. We alluded to that when we brought Ted on board today. Let's talk about that. What products might be impacted most, either positively or negatively? And maybe we start with Mexico uh, first here, Ted, and we can talk about that and then transition over to Kevin and talk a little bit about Canada as well. It's really two different issues. Uh, Ted, why don't you open up with that? Sure. When it comes to Mexico, the USMCA was really less about opening up that market anymore and more about protecting the advances that we've made. Um, and I think it did a very good job. I don't think there's a lot of difference between the old NAFTA rules and the new USMCA rules, specifically when it comes to Mexico. Um, our advantage in Mexico is first and foremost logistic. We are their next door neighbor. Uh, nobody else is anywhere near as close to Mexico as the US is. Um, and so that gives us not only the ability to reduce logistics costs, it also gives us the ability to reduce logistics time and to um, improve our customer service. Where we, I think, have the biggest strength uh, into Mexico is obviously with things like nonfat dry milk. Um, they are our largest trading partner when it comes to nonfat dry milk. But also, uh, when it comes to cheeses, uh, they are a significant importer of cheeses from the U.S., um, both in terms of mozzarella uh, for the growing pizzeria business uh, in Mexico and, uh, and for uh, I, the... The Mexican cheese market, there's a number of cheeses that we can produce in the U.S. Uh, that fulfill some of the same needs uh, in, in terms of uh, how cheese is consumed in Mexico. Um, and so that market has been a good market for the U.S. and I think it will continue to be. And as their dairy industry, and I would say from a marketing standpoint, their dairy industry grows, their consumption, demand for dairy products grow, we're in a good position to continue to be the major beneficiary uh, of that growth. And before we turn it over to Kevin, I think it's important for our viewers, and Ted opened the door on that, and I want to expound on that a little bit. Hordes Dairyman started a Spanish edition of Hordes Dairyman back in 1994, uh, and we have an editorial team based out of Mexico City for that. And what's happened here over the past uh, decades, 
Mexico has become a better and better customer for our U.S. dairy products. But the other thing that's happened is the Mexican dairy farmers have grown their milk production too. So the industry is actually growing domestically for not only the farm-based milk production, but the consumers there are demanding more dairy. So it's a double win. And those things happen quite a bit in the markets that the U.S. has been involved with. Same story as in Japan for that matter. Kevin, uh, you're at the other end of the uh, U.S. geographical area here, and you have a little experience working with Canadians uh, up there, along with a lot of other areas in Southeast Asia. Let's talk USMCA, Kevin. Uh, for sure. I uh, actually still have family in Canada. My family emigrated from England to Toronto to New York, so I still have family up there. And when we first started up operations in 2014, we developed a pretty good trade of ultra-filtered milk going to Canada. It actually grew into about $30 million per, per annual basis. So um, come around 2016, I'm trying to get my numbers. I think 2016, Canada implemented a Class 6 and Class 7. Class 6 uh, was originated in the Ontario province, and then the national program was class seven, which reclassified the price of milk in Canada um, to be the lowest price in the EU or the United States um, at any given time if the product or if the milk was going to be used in ingredients such as skim milk powder or milk protein concentrates. So it was a much more of a balancing product. Um, so our, our sales into Canada abruptly stopped. So it's, it was impossible to compete at that point because they were using the lowest index from around the world to price the milk as class seven. Um, so it, the, there was really some encouragement with the new USMCA agreement, Kuzma as they call it in Canada. Um, they put the Canada first and so um, I, I find that funny, but they um, are getting rid of class six and seven, but however, the caveat there is they're retaining a certain formulation uh, calculation to price ingredient class milk that will go into skim milk powder, infant formula, or MPC, uh, which is milk protein concentrate. And lo and behold, when you read the new USMCA agreement, the agricultural section, that formula is class seven. They just won't call it class seven. So class seven was gotten rid of but left in principle. Uh, the other thing that was, was somewhat good is that they were going to have um, import limitations because at the same time Canada came out with class seven and you know Ted and I are competing with skim milk powder uh, that is coming out of Canada on the international market at the lowest price of any manufacturer in the world. So on one hand you've got you know the highest milk price in the world and then the other hand, they're selling the, the lowest price skim milk powder of anyone in the world. So one of the things that got put into the USMCA agreement is uh, export limitations on MPC skim milk powder and infant formula, which is going to one year from July 31st is going to go to 55,000 metric ton. A year from then, it'll go to 35,000 metric ton. However, the Canadians, I think, snookered us a little bit in that milk protein concentrates are classified as HS code 040490. So one of the things that those that don't export don't know is that high grade, high protein milk protein concentrates at 85% protein or above um, are exported under HS code 3504. So that, there's a caveat in this agreement that will allow Canada to export high protein MPC. And my sources within Canada tell me exactly what they're doing. The government's funding folks like Gay Lee to build milk protein concentrate, milk protein isolate operating plants within Canada. So so I can already see what's coming down the road. They're gonna they're gonna find a loophole. They found the loophole. It was built in in the agreement. So we'll we'll see exports of MPI coming out of Canada before too long. And then Ted can probably talk a little bit more about this. There's also TRQs. Canada opened up their market for fluid milk, for cheese, for yogurt, um, ice cream, and butter. And if you look at what they opened up, if you look at it on a, on a percent of the U.S. production, 
fluid milk and cheese is like two tenths of one percent of our annual production in the United States. Uh, yogurt is two tenths of one percent, um, or no, less than that. I'm thinking two tenths of a hundred. Uh, so it's two one hundredths of a percent. The only one of any significance is butter. Um, the butter market could be a win, but it has to be industrial butter. The Canadians are not going to allow us to export our retail butter. And furthermore, the importers that are going to get the TRQ allocations are Canadian processors. So they're not going to they're not going to compete with themselves. So anything they import will be a product that they do not have uh, in their you know product array or S SKUs as we call them. So some positives, but I'm more negative on USMCA. It's to me, it's no better than the old NAFTA agreement. Except Mark, for butter. <laughs> Mark, let's talk a little bit more about that. And again, TRQs are tariff rate quotas, and they're assigned to uh, bring in products either duty free or tariff free or tax free or very low cost to that. And then the rest is uh, t taxed at a rate or tariff that's so high that you don't even try to do it. Uh, so that there's a little bit of that at play. Now, I always try to put the hat on of my, uh, in this case, a Canadian dairy farmer or a dairy processor. They've seen, as Mark, you've called a couple cuts here, a death by a thousand cuts here. They had a trade agreement with Europe. They gave up a little ground. And now they got one with U U.S. Uh, they gave up a little ground. And these trade agreements aren't just about dairy. There's automobiles in them and everything else. So talk a little bit through that, Mark. Well, uh, these trade agreements are huge and complex, and typically they take years and years to negotiate because, you know, for example, um, the U.S. has to make some decisions about Canada, you know, that, well, they want to send us more plywood, and if they do that, um, you know, that's good for Canada in general, but, you know, we want to send them more milk and dairy products, so they got to give us something there. And, you know, there are those kind of trade-offs that go on. Intellectual property, manufacturing automobile parts, and that's a big deal, uh, you know, between both Mexico and Canada. Uh, so those trade agreements are incredibly complex, and if you're trying to evaluate, are we better off, it's a little hard to do just... Um, industry by industry, you have to look at the whole thing. So in some cases, we may sacrifice uh, something in one industry to have a better overall um, gain, you know, for the country. Uh, but, you know, as Kevin points out, these things, the devil is in the details. <laughs> um, it gets down to implementation. And, you know, I mean, honestly, if I put my Canadian hat on and take a look at, um, you know, what the product that Kevin said that they were beginning to sell quite a bit of, um, $30 million a year up into Canada, we slipped a puck past the goalie there. Um, that product, the milk protein isolate, did not have um, a, as Kevin says, HST code, a harmonized tariff code. It, it had no negotiations. By the way, Canada was not involved in dairy in the NAFTA agreement. You have to actually go back to the World Trade Agreement before that. Uh, Canada had opted out. And at that time, uh, milk protein isolate didn't exist. And so when, when we uh, began producing that product and it goes up to the border in a tanker truck and the customs folks in Canada look at that and say, what have you got? And you go milk protein isolate. They look down their list and say, oh, not there. So good. You're good to go. That was a threat to a Canadian dairy system. And uh, they, they did want to do something to stop that. Class seven, ultimately, you know, a uh, larger USMCA agreement and, uh, you know, bringing some of this into a discussion formally. So it's complicated. Very. We got a question that came in here. Um, it's a little bit of current question here. What has, or what, excuse me, let me start over. Why has the domestic use of MDM, non-fat dry milk, and SMP, skim milk powder, been so low this year? Why is the domestic so, Ted, you started talking about that 50% number and then it's climbed, but obviously if we're exporting more, we're probably using less domestically. What, what have you seen in the markets in that regard? Actually, I, I think, it, I think it's, a, it's, it's a more complex question than that. Um, 
so in the last 20 years, one of the, you were talking about the, the milk protein isolate and especially, especially milk protein concentrate in liquid form, um, some a product I know Kevin's very familiar with. A lot of mozzarella manufacturers who used to use a lot of non-fat dry milk in their manufacturing process have found that UF milk is actually a better product to use to, to supplement their yields. And so the use of that in the mozzarella manufacturing process domestically has increased substantially in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and I think that what we've seen is that has been a big reason for some of the decrease in the consumption of non-fat dry milk domestically uh, over, over, year, over even three, four, five, six years ago. However, I will also say this, um, if you look at the futures board or even any of the federal uh, milk marketing order sites right now, you're going to see that class three milk is going to be close to $25 a hundred weight in, uh, in, uh, this month. And the class four price is going to be closer to $14 a hundred weight. The price difference between skim solids from a, on a class four basis and skim solids on a class three basis is so large right now that we've just in the last couple of months, we've seen a very big increase in domestic uh, non-fat dry milk consumption as well. And so they're using powder instead of a lot of the, the liquid uh, that they've used in the past. Um, actually, I would even say they're still using the liquid too, but they're definitely using a lot more powder. Um, and so my gut tells me that as the numbers for the next few months come out, you're going to see a big pop in domestic use of non-fat dry milk as well. Um, I also think you're going to see a large increase in non-fat dry milk production. And so you have kind of this net, net, net effect. Exports may be up, domestic consumption may be up, but production is up at the same time because a lot of milk went towards class four when we were going through the, the worst part of the pandemic. Um, and, and all of that kind of wraps up into a place where our market prices have actually stayed relatively stable because all those different forces have more or less canceled each other out. Anything to add in that regard, Mark or Kevin? Yeah, it's, you know, as I said, it's complicated, right? And we do have this milk pricing system that allows us to think a little bit about what's my ingredient source going to be. Um, well, if we can get milk proteins less expensively by drying them first and calling them class four and then putting them in class three product, we'll do that. Um, if they are relatively equal or, or even more expensive in price, we don't want to do that. It's a lot easier and nicer to use a liquid product in a cheese plant to standardize a vat or maybe even spin some cream off if, uh, you know, cream is valuable. Um, although you then generally aren't going to do that, but, uh, you know, can be done. It's all about price relationships. And we do have some things that are creating opportunities for people that maybe at some 30,000 foot level, you can scratch your head and say, that doesn't make sense. Why do we do that? Yeah, the only thing, I, I'm not prepared for the question, Corey, but I've learned one thing in the, in the last few months. You can blame COVID for just about any mistake you make. So, um, <laughs> What we have seen, though, is that COVID has created some major supply chain imbalances. And if, you know, and I haven't seen the data, if nonfat dry milk, which normally in the United States goes into other products, it goes into cheese manufacturing, like Ted says, also goes into bakery applications. So with more people staying at home, less people going to restaurants, less people going out to bakery shops, I can see there's going to be less utilization throughout the food service industry. That that whole side of our food service delivery business and, and restaurant trade is suffering right now. So anybody that's um, using nonfat in a product that's used in, in food service, you're going to see some decrease in demand just from that. Um, you don't sure. go to the, you don't go to Costco and buy 50 pound bags of nonfat dry milk and take them home. You know. <laughs> At one time, um, our, our co colleagues at the U.S. Dairy Export Council in their monthly reports would put down what percent of the U.S. production is being exported, but they also had been putting in what percent of the U.S. equivalent production has been imported, because I think there's a group of farmers out, dairy farmers, dairy men and women, who think that we're just kind of horse trading here. And so I'm going off memory because I can't pull these numbers up right now, but if we're looking at 15 to 17 percent roughly, of our domestic production is turned into product and exported, 
the number on the flip side is about three to four percent of product inflows would be the equivalent of U.S. milk production, and that's been holding pretty darn steady. Mark, are those numbers right? Or Kevin and Ted could chime in. I'm going off memory there, but that's a question from one of our uh, people watching today. It's it's pretty close. Um, actually, we're below three percent and have been for a while. Um, it's in the high two percent range, and you know I should also say that. If you take a longer term perspective on that, if you go back like to early 2000s, that number has come down quite a bit. Um, and part of the reason for that, I think, is that, you know, what we used to export were just commodities that we wanted to get rid of. You know, it, it was butter at some points in time. It was um, nonfat dry milk at some points in time, uh, but not really very often other products. And what we tended to import were high value products, cheeses and things that we just didn't make in this country. We make a lot more high quality, interesting products now that um, are effectively competing against those things that used to be imports. So our imports are down. And when you think about it, and Europe has a, a great cheese making tradition in wines and those kind of things, but the United States now has more specialty cheese varieties than all of Europe combined. And you can drill down even deeper, and there are states that have more specialty cheeses than the United States. So the dairy world is really changing. And I, and I think that change brings us to what I would label a rather delicate question. But we have two panelists here that have been working on dairy exports so long that I think we need to have that discussion. And a delicate question would be this. Are the federal milk marketing orders well positioned? to make U.S. dairy competitive in a global market moving forward. And I think we need to have that conversation. It's not something we're gonna solve this year. Uh, there's a lot of other things we're dealing with because of COVID, as Kevin points out, but that discussion is gonna be coming. And uh, I don't know who wants to open up with comments on that. Kevin, why don't you start? I, some of the points you made in our dress rehearsal I thought were pretty good. Well, some of my points are not going to be popular, Ted, but um, That's okay. you know, you. <laughs> it's a loaded question that was just asked is, are the federal order systems um, allowing us to be competitive on a global stage? I'd say no, they are not. Um, the first point that became a, an immediate frustration factor for us as we ran our business from the get-go was we, the first production we made was exported. When we get the, we don't get the price of the milk until two weeks after the close of the month that we received it. So that type of system doesn't lend itself to be able to forward price on the world market and the world stage like all of the customers in the world market want. Our European counterparts can give a forward looking three month price. Um, New Zealand can go out a year if they'd like to because they pay their farmers once a, once a year. But here we are in a system in the United States where we don't know the price of the milk until after, after we've received it and have run it and put it into a product. Um, worse yet, we do have some man risk management tools that we use that are thinly traded, and that's the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So if we go out and we sell a customer a product for the next three months, we can use the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to forward price that sale. Oftentimes, we get caught up in, in somebody trying to do short covering or, because so, it's so thinly traded, it's easily movable and manipulated. So oftentimes we go uncovered, which is awfully scary as a company, because all we get to live off is the make allowance, and the make allowance is what what we get is a credit to manufacture a product. And I will argue all day long with Mark that the make allowance on a new factory only covers about half of the depreciation. And, you know, basically the make allowance covers your variable cost of manufacturing. So there's no incentive for anybody to come in and build a new drying plant. So everybody always asks, what's the, why are farmers dumping milk? There's absolutely no incentive for anybody to build a manufacturing plant to prevent the dumpage of milk. There's no financial incentive. The only people that are willing to do that are farmers who don't want to dump the milk. So, uh, 
I could go on and on with the issues that are related to the federal orders, but that's those are some of my frustrations with the federal order system. And before we turn it over to Ted, uh, you know, when he talks about only ones are farmers that want to build them, that would be a, far, a cooperative, a farmer-owned cooperative like Cayuga that he, uh, Kevin works for. And if you also caught here, and I, I think this is a healthy discussion here, at one time, Kevin was a student of Mark here as well, many moons ago. Uh, Kevin and I are sporting the same haircuts here, so we've been out of school a little bit. But I think it's interesting when we learn from each other and then go out in the industry and work on this, and our perspectives change a little bit here. But I wanted to bring viewers along on that. Uh, so I'll turn that over to either Mark or Ted for continued discussion. Why don't we go with Ted first and then go to Mark? So I have to echo uh, Kevin's sentiments about the federal order system. I think we are, even though we export 17% of our uh, milk solids at this point, uh, we're participating in the, ex the export market with one hand tied behind our back uh, for a couple of different reasons. And, and I do believe the federal order system has a lot to do with that. Uh, one of the things that I think the federal order system has a tendency to do is it has a tendency to position us to make commodity products because the way the federal order system is set up, there's a, an embedded incentive to take the small of, smallest amount of risk possible, which would be to produce a commodity product. Um, a great example is, is the recently concluded uh, USMCA. Uh, when they issued the tariff rate quotas, they gave it to the processors, basically to incentivize the processors that if they are gonna import anything from the US, they're gonna import a commodity. Well, what we as an industry in the U.S. would prefer would be for Canada to take that small 3% of Canadian milk production and import a value-added product that we produce in the U.S. Well, and that's what we'd like to see them do, whether it's a branded product that's going to be sent directly to retail uh, or if it's a high-value um, you know, uh, ingredient product like some of which uh, Cayuga makes, uh, the, the company Kevin runs but they've set it up purposefully to make that a disincentive to shoot towards the high value added products. Meanwhile, and Mark, you referenced uh, Irish butter uh, uh, a few minutes ago, you know, Kerrygold is now the second leading brand of butter in the United States. You know, the US system has allowed, and I'm not, it has allowed an Irish company that produces butter to grow their brand to the point that they are exporting a large amount of butter to US to sell directly to the consumer. The same is true for a lot of specialty cheese products coming out of Europe. That's what the US needs to focus on. That's where the US, if the US really wants to be not just a long-term player in the export market, but a long-term player who's going to create value-added product, products, which ultimately means we're gonna be able to pay our farmers more, we need to have a system that encourages that. And the federal order system doesn't do that. It doesn't do it because it doesn't allow us to successfully forward price product like Kevin uh, has talked about, but it also doesn't create an incentive to take that risk to really produce those value added products. Okay, <laughs> now it's my turn. <laughs> and I'm not going to be a, uh, you know, a staunch defender, you know, of the status quo. But I think that uh, even though I'm the oldest of all three of us here, or four of us here on this uh, screen that we're sharing, uh, federal orders actually even predate me. Um, however, uh, I will say that, you know, if you go back into time and think a little bit about why did we get federal orders in the first place? What problem were they trying to solve? Um, it's perhaps a very different problem than we have today. Federal orders uh, begin and maybe don't quite end, but almost with fluid milk, beverage milk. Those are the only plants that must be regulated if you have a federal order. All the rest of these plants don't have to be. There's an incentive, of course, most of the time uh, to be in that pool and to be regulated, but it is a choice. Um, I do agree that it does create a series of incentives that may make it difficult for us to produce the products and listen to the customers to provide them with uh, the export customers to provide them with the products that would be perhaps most beneficial to a U.S. dairy system, um, but nevertheless, it is uh, it is a system that we have in place and probably needs some modification. 
Thank you, uh, Mark. And as uh, our industry is a little bit different in the United States, as Kevin has shared with me previously, there's uh, organizations in Europe like Arla uh, that are a lot more integrated and make many more, more products. So you can balance this a little easier uh, as a co-op in that way, or Friesel and Campina would be another one. I, I think uh, we got a question in from one of our regular commentators here, Andy Novakovic, and Kevin, it's gonna be going to you, and you know uh, Andy is good at uh, stirring discussion here, and it's a healthy one, and Mark kind of alluded to it, so I'm setting you up here with some time to think. Kevin, what do you say to the fact that no one forces a class four plant to be in the federal order system? If that pricing regulation is so limiting, why don't you exercise your right to operate outside the FO price regulation? now? So Andy puts that out there. It, it's oh well, yeah, that's a good that's a good question, and that's a that's a great question by Andy. And here's the reason: we have an advantage as a class four plant because we're not diversified. Uh, take for example Arla or Friesland Campina in Europe. They make uh, a whole array of products uh, from fluid to yogurt to cheese to uh, to to powders. They they in essence have their own federal order system inside their company walls. Um, what the federal order system has done in the United States is allowed all of us to specialize. And as specialists, we have to compete with other specialists in our arena. So yeah, Andy is right. We could deep pool and drop out of the federal order system. But the world market return for the, the price of our quote unquote, what well, we you know, consider a class four milk will result in a lower pay price to our farmers. So we participate because it's part of the system. If the federal order system were no longer around, you bet your bottom dollar, we would be talking to all of our neighbors about a merger so that we had fluid, cheese, powder, and yogurt in our portfolio so we could we could return the highest price to our members so we could compete with our european counterparts very good discussion we're coming up to the top of the hour here and i'd ask uh ted or kevin as our guests here if you have any final comments that you'd like to share on today's program dairy traders talk trade ted i think the only thing i'd comment is is I, i'm going to ask kevin a question which is which do you think would be more efficient if you merged with your neighbors rather than having a federal order system wouldn't that create an incentive to always push the milk towards the highest value return versus what we have today where the milk will go like right now you actually have milk going towards class four plants even though class three prices are a lot higher because actually people are afraid to make cheese because the cost of the milk is so high Ted, you and I are aligned. I I would say yes. You would always you would have um you have a full time accountant on staff that was constantly making calculations as to where the milk should flow, based on returns. Because if you're a, a true farmer cooperative, you want to return the highest milk price to your members, and you're always going to make that calculation of what returns the highest price to my farmers. I agree. Kevin, what any final uh, comments from you outside of that? Um, <laughs> I, I guess I don't, I don't really have any, any comments. I mean, I, I, I would like to see a day where we, you know, one of the things that when we were starting out, I didn't know anything about processing. So we embarked on a, on a mission to learn about processing and we traveled, we traveled the globe and I learned going to, the European Union countries, we went to France and we went to Germany and Denmark and Holland. I was really impressed with the processing companies. The R&D effort, the just immense amount of R&D effort they put into it, the processing, the quality of their products, the innovation was astounding. And I always said to myself, if we could marry that with the producers that we have in the United States were some of the best producers around the globe, I arguably are the best producers around the globe. You marry those two, we're unstoppable. So that, I've got probably another 20 years in this. I would like to grow our company 
to be that type of company that you would see in Europe. And then if we do it right, we can drop out of the federal order, just like Andy points out, and not worry about it. And Mark, uh, any other additions to this conversation before we wrap up? Um, not particularly. I would say that, um, you know, we are going to grow. I, there's just all kinds of incentives to do that. Um, we've got growing pains. Um, we need to think about the rationalization of the system we have here. And COVID has exposed lots of things. Many of the uh, discussions that we've had right here at the very end, you know, about diversifying our uh, products, you know, that we may be producing in a single company is one of those things that could have probably helped us as well um, under the uh, impact of demand collapse at the beginning of COVID. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll be addressing some of these issues for sure. Well, I'd like to thank our guests, Ted, Kevin, and Mark for being on the program today. Our next dairy live stream will be Wednesday, August 5th at noon Eastern Daylight Time, where we are talking about uh, how farmers are accounting for every nickel during COVID-19. We have Gordy Jones already agreeing to be our guest, and Chris Wolf will be uh, our commentator there, and we're working on getting one more uh, dairy farmer to be part of that panel. And so with that, we will wrap up today's dairy live stream, and I'm again Corey Geiger, editor of Hordes Dairyman, and thank you for joining us on this conversation, uh, Dairy Traders Talk Trade. Have a great day.